Second Samuel, chapter number 17. one verse together before we pray. When you find that, let's all stand in honor of the Word of God. <clears throat> Second Samuel 17, verse number 8. For said, Hushai, thou knowest thy father and his men, that they be mighty men, and they be chafed in their minds as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field. And thy father is a man of war and will not lodge with the people. I want to talk to you this morning about chafed in the mind. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I want to thank everyone who showed up to church faithfully this morning, Lord. I pray that you'll bless them for their faithfulness, bless them for their love for the Word of God. No one uh, accidentally came to church this morning. No one just happened to walk in the front doors. They made a conscious decision to obey you and to be in your house. And I pray that you'll um, work through me this morning, Lord. I pray that you'll uh, overlook my faults, help my mind to be focused only on you and the message you want me to convey this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter number 23. This morning is going to be a little bit of a, uh, a different message than I've ever, I don't, I don't know if I've ever preached a message um, like this one before. Um, I don't have any points. I don't have any um, illustrations written down. I don't have any sub points or any, any of that. Um, I don't want to call it story time, but it's going to be, we're going to read some stories in the Bible. And sometimes the best thing of the Bible, about the Bible is just read it and let it be. And I'm sure I'll have commentary here and there. But um, I think a lot of times we, don't, we, we overlook things in the Bible. We don't read things in the Bible um, that we should. What we just read in 2 Samuel 17, they were talking about the man who wrote this passage. And I want to I start off with Psalm 23 um, for somewhat of a context, but... Um, well, let's read it. Probably one of the most famous, pa outside of maybe John 3.16, probably the most famous passage in the Bible. Unsaved people know this passage. Unsaved people have this hanging in their house, right? Everyone loves this passage. And it's a great passage. I'm not any slight to it. It's an incredible passage, especially if you're going through sorrow or pain or, or suffering in your life. Psalm 23 is an incredible passage. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me to the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of thine en mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David, um, in the Bible, was a uh, godly man. Uh, God used him a lot. But I think too many times, and if you were here um, Wednesday night, it kind of goes along with what we heard about uh, unicorns and rainbows, right? It's total, whatever the Bible says about those two things is complete opposite of what you're going to find on Cartoon Network or Disney Channel and all that other stuff, right? You, you see some effeminate, um, just to recap from Wednesday night, you see some effeminate, fairy-looking uh, horse, where the Bible talks about a horse with strength that's destroying or killing people, running over it's, it's a it's, a, it's a sign of strength. You look at a modern-day unicorn, you don't think strength, right? And too many times we've been so inundated by the world's, definition of things, not just of things in life, but things in the Bible. Perfect example is this. I'm not saying you should do it, but if you were ever to use your phone in church, now would be the time to do it. And just Google an image of King David. And most of the images that you'll find on Google, he looks like an effeminate. There 
are some that portray him as a man of war. He's got, a, but even ones that have him with a shield on, you know, he, you know, he's got perfectly permed hair, right? You know, nothing's out of place. He's got cute little curls here. That's not the David of the Bible. That, that's not, now, it's the same David who wrote Psalm 23, but it's also the same David that was described as a, as a nutcase in 2 Samuel. It's Absalom, to, to, to put the, in context what we read in our text verse, Absalom, which is the rebellious son of the king who happened to have long flowing hair, who was proud of his hair and ended up being how he died, Absalom kicks his father off the throne. Absalom takes over for the king, right? Absalom has run off David, and he's meeting with his counselors here, and they're talking about whether they should pursue David. They're talking about whether they should run him down and take this man. And he brings in his and they agree. They say, yes, hunt him down, but he gives them a warning. He be chafed in their minds. That is the only time in the Bible that the word chafed is mentioned. And we all know what chafed means. It's a uh, friction. Something gets worn out because it's too much friction going on, right? And I love the terminology in the Bible. We all know it, like, modern terminology, he's got a few screws loose, right? Everyone knows what that means. He's, he's missing a few marbles, right? He, he's a few fries short of a happy meal. Do I need to continue? We kind of know what this means here. And I love the terminology in the Bible, you know? The same thing happens when um, Leah and Rachel, right? The Bible says Rachel was beautiful, but Leah was tender-eyed, Right? Tender eyes. It's the only time it's mentioned, but we know what it means because in the same verse she goes, Rachel was fair and beautiful to look upon. Leah, she was tender eyed. She was ugly. Right? You know, they're, they're, there's no other way to put it. And the Bible calls her tender eyed, right? And, you know, same thing with uh, the Bible says the uh, whole, I think it was the Syrian army, they all woke up dead. Right? How do you wake up dead? I don't know, but they did. Right? And so there's a lot of things in the Bible that, to me, I just, I look at it and I laugh. The Bible is a fun book to read. I don't care what anybody says. One of the funniest stories to me in the Bible is the story of Balaam. Here he is, a wicked prophet, driving down the road, disobeying God, and his ass starts talking to him. And Balaam is such an idiot, he talks back to the ass. You know, because that's going to fix it, right? But here we have a description of David in the Bible where he says, you know what? This guy's a nutcase. Pursue him, but, you know, keep in mind that he's a man of war and he shouldn't be trusted. Too many times we try and please everyone and make everyone happy. And just because someone calls you crazy, that's not a bad thing. Of all the insults that I've ever had in my life, probably the one I enjoy the most is when someone calls me crazy. Because I usually look back and go, yeah, okay, that's true. That's true. There ought to be something about a Christian that the world looks at you and goes, you know what? Something's not right upstairs. Something's wrong. And so we're going to go through some Bible stories this morning. I like I just want to read it because too many times we think we got to be this uh, paper cutter. This is what it is, and and we can't move out of this box. And I want to read some stories in the Bible about men of God that just were a little loose in the head. They just went a little too far. And I'm just going to read these stories. So I'm I don't think I'm going to make anybody upset this morning. I'm not going to. I have no. Notes to make anybody upset. I'm not going to pick on anybody individually. The only people that might get upset this morning are the people that say, you know what, Pastor, you've gone too far. If you're that person, you might not like this morning. Because we're going to read some verses in the Bible, some stories in the Bible, where the man of God went, what you would say, too far. You went overboard. You know, people say, listen, Pastor, I agree with what... People come to me and they'll be like, I, I agree with what Pastor said. Right, but he's right, but does he have to say it? The, we're going to read some stories in the Bible where men of God, where I guarantee people were looking at, come on, man, really, you're going to go that far? You really have to say that? Pastor, you have to preach that today. You know they came today. You've got to preach that now. Can't you save it for next week, right? The, all these things we hear because we look at a man of God and we look at someone and like, you know what? We want you to be what the world wants a man of God to be. The problem is what the man of God, what the world wants a man of God, and I put that in quotes, what they want the man of God to be, some effeminate, fag, unicorn-looking guy who makes everybody happy. And that's nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible do you see somebody like that. When there's a man of God, you think of John. He went and preached right in front of the White House about the king having his, his brother's wife. That, that, that's taken a little far, preacher, don't go that far. You can preach it in the pulpit. Just don't go out there and preach it. John lost his head for it because he went a little too far. He took it a little too far. You could say he was chafed in the mind. He took the Bible thing just a little too far. He took the Christian thing a little too serious. If the world doesn't think you're crazy, you're probably not the right kind of Christian. 
David loved God. And by the way, David was a man after God's own heart. Amen. You know what the military... Gen these, aren't, these guys describing David aren't political leaders. These are military leaders. They know crazy people. But you know what they said about David? Something's wrong. Something's wrong upstairs. Hey, that guy who was chafed in the mind wrote a large chunk of your scripture. He wrote Psalm 23 that you like going to every time you were hit in sorrow. Hey, there was a man who understood hardship. There was a man who understood. He was a man of war, the Bible says. Hey, it's about time we understand. You know what? I'm not going to play this Christian thing halfway. I'm going to go all the way. Now, we all, the Bible says we ought to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but there ought to come a time where you put your fight and your combat boots on, you strap on your weapon and say, you know what, I don't care what the world thinks of me. I'm going to live for God and I'm going to serve God. Turn to 1 Samuel 17. Let's go back to where David started. David was a shepherd. Remember, he goes to fight Goliath. He comes to visit his brothers. His brother goes, David, is there not a cause? What are you doing? You're causing problems. What are you doing here? You came here to see the battle. You know, they're mocking him, this little shepherd boy. He sees Goliath. Goliath of Gath comes out, starts blaspheming, cursing God, right? And David goes, what's this guy doing? Is nobody going to fight him? And his brothers again start to mock him, criticize him. What are you doing? And David goes, I'll fight him. Oh, come on, David. Come on. Someone goes, well, that's the first person to volunteer. Listen, I may not be the most eloquent preacher. I may not be the most intelligent person, but I'll volunteer. I may botch it up the first couple times, but you know what? I may botch it up every time, but that's okay. I'm willing to go on the battlefield. Too many people are too scared, and they're too afraid to get in the mix and do something for God. David, as a young boy, said, you know what? I'll take on the Goliath. I'll take on the giant. The whole army, the old trained military at the time was in there hiding from this giant. They were afraid of him. And you know what David said? I'll take him. So someone went to Saul and said, Saul, listen, we got somebody here who's willing to fight Goliath. He's not tall. He's not old. He's not a soldier. But he's the only one who's volunteered so far. So he goes in to meet Saul, right? Saul goes, listen, David, here. Here's my armor. Take my armor. Saul, the Bible says, was a tall man. Even he was too much of a coward to fight Goliath. So you know what he does? He tells David, here, take my weapons. You can fight. You know what David said? I don't need it. Eh? He goes, I've never used these. I haven't tried them. He goes, I got a slingshot, though. I'll go take on Goliath. He goes, picks up five smooth stones from the brook, right? He takes on Goliath. And an interesting story about Goliath that I've always uh, not quite understood, but it makes sense when you think that he's chafed in the mind, right? David describes how he's killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands, right? And again, if, you, if, you're, if you're still on Google, look at images of David this morning. You see his cute little boy playing a harp, and he did play a harp, right? You see his cute little boy with, you know, Arms thinner than my pinky, you know, playing a little harp. You know, when you think of a harp player, you think of that, an effeminate guy. David killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands. All right, he wasn't this, this little small scrawny little kid who didn't know. But one of the things that always amazed me about that is he had a slingshot. He didn't kill him with a slingshot. David said, no, I'll kill him with my bare hands. There was something about David that said, you know what? I could use this gun here, but nah, I'll kill him with my bare hands. There's something wrong with David that made him perfect to take down Goliath. There was a son about David that said, I'll do it. Come on, let's go. He goes up, and in verse number, 1 Samuel 17, verse 51, you know the story. He goes up to Goliath. He confronts Goliath. They have their conversation. And Goliath goes, today the dogs are going to eat you. And David goes, well, forget you. Today they're going to pluck out your eyes, right? He starts running at Goliath. Not only does he front, uh, confront Goliath, he's running at a giant that is almost 10 feet tall. Running straight at the guy while swinging his slingshot. He hits Goliath in the forehead. He falls down dead. Verse 51, for lack of time, this is the one verse we'll read. Because this is the one, like right up until this point, you can be like, you know what, David? David's doing his deed. David is obeying God. He's serving God, right? He's, he's standing up for Jesus Christ. He's not going to let some uh, filthy Philistine blaspheme God, right? He's, he's doing his duty as a countryman, as a Christian, as a Bible believer. Good job, David. Then verse 51 comes, and it's like, you know what, David? Why'd you have to go and do that? Verse 51. Maybe this is why they thought David was chafed in the mind. It could have been the same advisors that were advising Saul that are now advising Absalom. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword. David didn't have a sword. 
he takes the Philistine sword and drew it out of his sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines and there came out of the valley and to the gates of Ekron and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of Sherem even unto Gath. Verse 54, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it unto Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. David doesn't just kill Goliath. David doesn't just kill the ultimate enemy. All of Israel is shouting for joy. They're chasing down the enemy. David takes his time, walks up and goes, all right, I ain't got a sword. He pulls out the Goliath sword, cuts off his head. Not only does he just leave his head, he grabs the head of the giant, drags it back to Jerusalem to show King Saul. That's a little too much, don't you think? You know what, though? God made David king. God said, you know what? That's who I want to be the king of Israel. That's the one I want that the world's going to look at and go, you know what? Something's wrong upstairs. Listen, let the Times Union think what they want about us. Let the protesters think what they want. They're going to call They've been calling us crazy for thousands of years. If they didn't call us crazy, I'd be worried. Right? If everybody in Troy went, oh, there's such nice people down there. You should go to there. I'd be like, I ain't going there. I want to go to, I want to, go to the church where they're like, no, no, something's wrong. Something's wrong upstairs. That's what they thought of David. Now, you may not like it, but that's exactly what they thought of King David. You know why? Because David took things just a little too far. If David had a motto, it would be overkill is underrated. That the David did not care what anybody thought. He was going to go all the way. Turn a few chapters later, chapter number 22. It's kind of a running theme in David's life, you're going to see. And yet God still chose him to write so much of the Bible. Psalm 22. Or, I'm sorry, first name. Actually, let's go to chapter 18. Uh, how did I almost miss this one? <laughs> oh, boy, this one's going to be... Verse 17. First Samuel 18, verse 17. And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter Mirab, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me. You know, because David hasn't proved how valiant he is, right? So King Saul's like, I want you to prove to me that you're a valiant man of war. And here's the task. Be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. So Saul's giving David a task here. And he's going, Listen. If you want to marry my daughter, I'm going to give you this task. Saul, obviously, and if, for lack of context, hates David, right? And he goes, I'm going to give David a task he can't complete so that the Philistines can kill him, and I ain't got to deal with David anymore, right? Because don't forget, they were, they were crying, make David our king, right? Because David was the one who fought Goliath. David was uh, gaining uh, notoriety. Verse number uh, 18. And David said unto Saul, Who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have, have been given to David. She was given unto Adriel, the Mothelite, to white. And Milcal, let's see here, I'm missing, I wrote it down wrong. Oh, verse 21. All right, verse 20. And Milcal, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him to thee, give him her, and that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one, in one of the twain. And Saul commanded his servant, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love in thee. Now therefore the king's son-in-law. No, I'm missing a... There's one verse I really want to read. Uh, there's one before 27 I want to get to. All right, let's run, jump down. <clears throat> oh, there it is, verse 25. And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, 
but in a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So Saul tells David, listen, I'll give you my daughter, my daughter to be your wife, but you've got to go kill me a hundred Philistines and castrate them and bring them back to me. That'll be, that, that's, that in and of itself is a little overkill. That in and of itself is a bit much. Now, King Saul's doing it to trap David. King Saul's doing it because he goes, David can't do that. David's going to die, right? Let's continue reading verse 26. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines 200 men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them him full in the tail of the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Milcow's daughter to wife. So here's somebody who hates David, sets up David to die. He goes, David, here, go get me a hundred uh, foreskins of the Philistines. And you know what David does? I'll do one better, buddy. I'll bring you back 200. You know what he's doing? Taking it a little too far. You know what the Bible says? If someone begs you to take, uh, uh, go a mile with them, go twain. Hey, there's something about that. We ought to go a little overboard. We ought to go overboard in loving people, caring for people. But when the time comes that you need to do business, you better do business. You better do something for God and say, I'm not afraid of what the world's going to label me as. Hey, you know what? Because what the world has done is they've changed this word crazy to make you crazy for doing things that are normal. Literally, you, if you're a normal human being 50 years ago, you're crazy today. You dress like someone dressed 100 years ago, you're crazy. You live like you lived 100 years ago, you're crazy. All you have to do, I'm not saying to go out and kill 100 Philistines or 200 Philistines, right? That's not what I'm talking about this morning. But guess what? When God tells you to live right, you better live right because you know what the world's going to do? They're going to call you crazy. Just for doing the bare minimum of what God tells you to do, they're going to label you as crazy. And you've got to be okay with being labeled as a little crazy, a little chafed in the head, a little, a little short, a few marbles, a few screws loose. That's okay because David was used of God because he was not afraid of what he's going to be labeled as. It gets better, though. Turn to 1 Samuel 22. <clears throat> You're just going overboard, Pastor. You're just going a little too far. You don't have to preach that all the time. You preach it sometimes. This is the same David that wrote Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Here you go, Saul. I got him for you. Here's Goliath's head, Saul. That's the same David. And now, for chapter 22, this is Saul now chasing down David, trying to kill David. So David's got to band together, get himself some guys. Who does he find? 1 Samuel 22, verse 2. Describing David's men. And every one that was in distress, and every one that was in debt, and every one that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. David literally had the scroungiest, the most worthless group of guys gathered to him, fighting against the ultimate king's army. David became king, by the way. Jump to the end. David does become king. Saul doesn't make it too far. You know why God chose David, even though he only had a small rag team of guys that were discontented, distressed, and in debt? Because David said, you know what? God, if you tell me to do it, I'm going to do it. I may go a little overboard, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to get the job done. Too many Christians want to take God's command, and instead of going too far, they want to go halfway. And you know what God says? That's lukewarm, and I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. God says, I'd rather you be hot. I'd rather you be cold. I don't want you to be lukewarm. God doesn't need lukewarm Christians. God needs somebody like David who's chafed in the mind, who says, I'm going to take God serious, and I'm going to go all the way. Maybe I'll go overboard, but I'd rather go to church too much and not go to church enough. I'd rather read my Bible too little or, or too much and rather read my Bible too little. <clears throat> Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. <clears throat> Come back tonight. Maybe that preacher will give you a cute sermon with illustrations and points and all that. We're just going to read some Bible stories today. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And verse number 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. God, God doesn't need a deep theologian. 
God's not looking for the guy sitting there with three PhDs in his office at some, at some campus or some college somewhere. You know where God's looking for? Somebody who's maybe not that smart to the world. The Bible says foolish. All right, a, a equivalent of stupid. But God says, you know what, I'll take that one that nobody else wants. The one like David, who maybe doesn't have a college education, maybe doesn't know all the biblical terminology, but says, you know what, God said it, I'm going to do it. Hey, the preacher's preaching, he's right, I'm going to say amen. Hey, the preacher says go soul winning, I'm going to go soul winning. Hey, I'm going to live my life for God. That's what God's looking for. He's not looking for you to be super intellectual this morning. He's just looking for you to live for God. Wars aren't won by being nice. And you are in a war, by the way. You are a soldier, of, you're supposed to be a soldier of the cross. Maybe you're AWOL this morning. Maybe you want to fall back on the back lines and not serve God, but you are a soldier. Once you accepted Christ, you, you're given the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, you want to discard that uniform you've been given. If you want to discard the duties God's given you, that's on you. But if you're going to be a soldier of the cross, you need to get it through your thick skull. There's a war going on or else you're going to get shot. Because the devil's not going to get, stop shooting at you just because you decided not to put your armor on this morning. You can sit there and advocate your uh, responsibilities all you want, but the devil's still going to shoot at you. He's still going to try and destroy your life. The best thing you can do, the best thing you can do is put your armor on, put your breastplate on, put your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, get the sword of the spirit and fight the devil straight on. But you know why people don't want to do that? Because someone's going to go, I don't know, something's wrong upstairs. That's okay. Look who's talking. You know, the people that can't figure out what gender they are are telling me I'm crazy. I, I, I'm okay with that. I really am. You know? The people that are endorsing borderline pedophilia now are telling me that I'm sheltered. I don't get out enough. Okay. Go with that one. I'm okay with those people insulting me. God insults me, I'm not okay with that. God tells me I'm lukewarm, I'm not okay with that. When the world does it, when the protesters do it, okay, whatever, you're going overboard. That's okay. <clears throat> Unbelievable. Let's see here, what are we going to go to next? Let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings, chapter number 18. It's not just David. There's a lot of them. Pastor, you just ought to be nice to these people. You ought to, you ought to, you ought to be kind to these people. And we ought to be kind. We ought to be loving. But there's a time where going overboard is okay. That's a little too much. Don't you think you're going too far? You're, 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 you're mocking them too much? Let's see what Elijah thought of that. 1 Kings 18. Let's start in verse number, boy, so much to read. Yeah, let's start in verse number 20. There's been a, a famine in the land. There's been a drought in the land. There's no rain. There's nothing, right? Here comes Elijah, right? Elijah always had a good attitude, right? Listen, I may not always have a good attitude, but I've always got a smile on my face, you know? I may have a bore attitude, but I'm going to enjoy I, I may, I'm going to enjoy it. I may be cranky, but I'm going to smile while I'm cranky, right? That's not Bible, that's commentary. All right, let's get back to the Bible. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. You know, Elijah had the same exact problem we have today. People wanted to sit right in the middle. They didn't want to choose which way. And Elijah goes, well, pick. Which way are you going to go? You're going to follow God? You're going to follow Baal? Hey, 2020, the question still applies. Who are you going to follow? You're following God, you're going to follow Baal. Just turn on your TV, open up the newspaper, you'll find Baal. He's still out there. You're going to follow God or you're going to follow Baal? And you know what, ba and you know what they did? They didn't say a word. Nothing. Nothing. He confronts them about their backsliding. He confronts them about their sin. He confronts them about everything. You know what they do? Mealy mouth. That's what that's called. Mealy mouth. You got nothing to say. Nothing to say when you say it's, uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe. If it, I guess so, maybe. No. Elijah said, I'll show you what's got to be done. And let's find out what Elijah does. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. 
Pretty good odds to me. One man of God against 450 Baal prophets, right? Here we go. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under. And call you on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is spoken. They want to take sides, but all right, we'll, we'll let you two fight it out, right? And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. It's about six hours, right? Morning, starting around six, to about noon, let's say. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which they made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lassets till the blood gushed out upon them. And you know what Elijah did? He mocked them. God, cry a little louder. You're taking it a little too far, don't you think? You know, you're going too far this time. You know what Elijah was? He was chafed in the mind. The world sat there and said, what are you doing? They're cut, they were literally cutting themselves with knives, jumping on an altar for Baal to answer them. Let me tell you something right now. That's exactly what the world's doing today. They're sacrificing themselves to Baal with their lives, with their actions, and with their words. And some of them are just crazy enough to literally cut themselves. They still do it. Why? And they want to call you crazy. And it came to pass, when midday was past, that they prophesied until the time of the offering of evening sacrifice, and there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me, and all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now, that right there is overboard. Here are these Baal prophets bleed. The Bible said gushing out. They didn't just cut themselves. They're gushing out of blood. Elijah's mocking them, right? Elijah could have stopped right there, called down fire from heaven and said, you know what? I'll prove right now that God is God. And you could argue that Elijah already went overboard by mocking them and saying, call out. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's on a trip. Elijah, some, for some strange reason, didn't think that was enough. And he goes a little further just to take him off. Because there's no legitimate reason for him to do anything he's about to do in the middle of a famine and a drought. Verse 33, And he put the wood in the order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it, pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time, and they did it a third time. So here you've got 450 Baal prophets been crying from morning until evening now, cutting themselves, crying out to their God at their altar. Here's Elijah, prepares his altar, cuts his sacrifice up, says, bring me four barrels of water, douse it. All right, do it again, do it again, do it again. All of them are still crying to their God. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, 
Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kershon and slew them there. He went overboard like four times in one story. He didn't just stop. All right, the agreement was you, you sacrifice yours, I'll sacrifice mine. They couldn't sacrifice. He starts mocking them, make fun of them. You know what you, know what, you, know what you would have done? Elijah, please. Elijah, they're going to write another article about you. Elijah, Elijah, please. Elijah, they're going to show up and protest you next Sunday. Elijah, please. He's not going to stop, is he? All right, get him, get him, get him some water. He's not going to stop till you get him the water. Dump the water on it. Go get me some more water. Elijah, Elijah, we literally have no water to drink. It is a drought. Bring me more water. You better bring him water. The, guy, the guy's got something wrong. We have no water to drink, but he wants water here to pour on the sacrifice just to prove the prophets of Baal that God is God. Hey, let me tell you something right now. He was chafed in the mind. He was a little crazy. He took this thing that God told him to do seriously. And then after it's all said and done, you know what he did? He took him down the river and he cut him to pieces. That's what a man of God does. Now, you may not like it, but that's what's needed sometimes. Sometimes you need an old-fashioned man of God to get behind the pulpit and say, hey, thus saith the Lord, this is what the Word of God says. He doesn't care what you think. He doesn't care what your neighbor thinks. He doesn't care what he thinks. He only cares about what God thinks. That's what's missing in America. That's what's missing in God's churches today. But instead, we want somebody who's going to mount the pulpit and go, dear little beloved, we're gathered here together. Now, please be careful and don't smile at them. Right? We can't smile. Elijah mocked them, criticized them, then he killed them. That's what happened. He was a little chafed in the mind. Don't forget the story about, remember the story of when Jezebel sends, I think it was Jezebel, Ahab sends uh, messengers to Elijah. It comes with 50. They say, we want you to come meet the king. Come down now from this mountain. He said, well, if I be, if I be a man of God, let fire consume you. Fire comes down, kills him. Next guy comes, come down and meet the king. Well, if I be a man of God, fire's going to come down and continue, kills all of them. Third guy finally comes down begging, please, please don't kill me. Please. You know what, you know what happened? They saw a man of God with power. You know what they saw? Somebody who wasn't afraid of the world. Somebody that wasn't afraid to do what God told them to do. The problem is, these people never seen a man of God before. they never seen somebody stand up for the truth before. So they see one, they're like, oh my, oh my, what in the world? Everybody preached like this 75 years ago. Every man of God preached like this 100 years ago. The problem is you ain't seen it because too many of them are cowards nowadays. David was chafed in his mind. All right, let's move on. Second Kings, I want to read another one. I'm having fun. You having fun? I don't know, I'm having fun. Second Kings, chapter number 9. What are they going to say about us? Who cares? Who really cares? Literally the worst thing they could say about you, whatever they say, in two weeks they're going to come up with something worse. It doesn't matter. They don't even know. They make it up as they go. Who cares? You know? The funniest part is when they call you the most extreme thing because they think you're embarrassed of it and you're like, no, no, I believe that. What? 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 You know? You go to that church, that pastor said that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe it, too. Here, let me show you the Bible. What? Why? What in the world? Why? Because they've never been confronted with it. I ask them, well, the problem is they're mad at the Bible. The problem is they're mad at Christianity. True Bible Christianity. And the problem is they've never heard it before. Someone finally, finally confronts them with it, and they're like, what? What? They don't know the Elijah of the Bible. See, what they know is the Jesus that they see in the pictures. The Jesus that they see in the pictures, Right? Cute little Jesus sitting down with his disciples with, uh, pass me the wine, a little, few more bread, right? That's what they're used to seeing. They don't see the Jesus running through a whip, beating them out of the temple. And if you do see the picture of Jesus beating with a whip, he still looks effeminate. You know? Jesus was a carpenter, by the way. He was a carpenter. He probably had a few calluses on his hands. He knew how to carry lumber. He wasn't this fairy tale little guy who rode a unicorn to church. That's not who Jesus was. David wasn't some little girly guy who sat around not doing anything. 2 Kings 9. This one's going to be hard because I want to read the whole chapter and I probably shouldn't because we're running out of time. 
Listen, if we get two hours in and you got an appointment this afternoon, feel free to get it up and leave. I'm not going to hold it against you. Um, <laughs> I told him to zoom in the camera so that if, if half of you leave, nobody knows. Uh, 2 Kings chapter number 9. Oh. You start on verse number 6. Literally, Jehu is named king immediately. Right? And the first thing he does, the first thing he does, he doesn't go and decorate the mansion. He doesn't have an inaugural ball. He doesn't give a long speech. He doesn't do anything. You know the first thing he does? He gets in his chariot and rides to Jezebel. <laughs> Literally, the first thing Jehu does, he doesn't do anything else. That is the first thing he does as king is take care of Jezebel. And literally everything about this story is overkill. Everything about it, you could sit, not, I don't know, maybe you would, I don't know, but your typical 2020 American Christian would be like, no, no, he went too far. He just went a little far. You know, go there, try and talk to her, you know, explain the situation, you're the king now, and you, you might be able to find some common ground. No, Jehu rode in his chariot like a literal madman to kill this woman. Oh, man. Oh, boy, let's see here. Verse 9, And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, and the dog shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel. And there shall be none of her to bury. And he opened the door and fled. Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his lord, and one of them said, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, Ye know the man and his communication. You know what they said? Who is this? Now, mad man doesn't mean angry. Now, he may have been angry. I'm not saying he wasn't. He's going to kill some woman. So he may have been mad, angry. But mad just means crazy, right? And notice what they said. You know this mad fellow. In other words, he's got a reputation of being a little loose. He's chafed in the mind, you could say. Not only that, but he says, you know his communication. So in other words, it's not just this one time. There wasn't this isolated incident, you know, where it said, that's why Jehu's crazy. No, there's a myriad of reasons. We know Jehu is a nut job. But God used Jehu. You know why? Because Jehu, when he said, no, wasn't always right. He made a lot of mistakes. But when Jehu set his mind to it, this is like Jehu's finest hour. When he was most crazy, but that's when God used him the most. You know when God can use you the most? When you set all physical limitations to the side and say, you know what, I'm going to go full bore for God. When you put all criticism to the side, you know, everything in moderation, brother, everything in moderation, sister. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, Barry Goldwater said, um, extremism in the defense of uh, liberty is no vice, but what is it? Uh, something about moderation. I can't remember now. But moderation is, is I don't want to be moderate. I don't want to be a moderate. And everyone's trying to win the moderate vote. That's a hogwash. That's, that's, you know what the Bible word for moderate is? Lukewarm. Middle of the road. Yeah, I, I'm middle of the road. No, 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 no. I am far right for Jesus Christ. That's what I am. I, you're going to get to heaven, right? God's got the, the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. God, I, I want to be a moderate. Now, where does that land you with God? I don't know. Maybe that's where limbo comes in. I don't know. I don't want to be a moderate. I want to be on the right side with the sheep. I don't want to be on the left with the goats. I don't want to be in the middle with the moderates and independent swing voters. I want to be on the right with Jesus Christ. They can say what they want. They can criticize all they want. They can mock all they want. That's okay. They did it to Jehu. They did it to Elijah. They did it to David. If they do it to you, count it as a badge of honor and move on to the next one. Back to Jehu. Let's see here. Verse 16. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. And there stood a watchman on the tower of Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came, and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take a horseman, and send to meet him, and let him say, Is it peace? They sent a messenger, right? We're going to make peace with this guy, whoever it may be. So there went one on horseback to meet him, and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman <clears throat> told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, 
is at peace. And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, He come even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshai, for he driveth furiously. There was something about Jehu that he drove like a nut job. All right, obey all traffic laws, okay? Uh, don't come back <laughs> and hold me in liability. Obey all traffic laws and wear your mask while you drive. Please, okay? I said it. Everyone happy? Sign the waiver. <clears throat> and Joram said, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, and each in his chariot. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu, then he said, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? And Joram turned his hands and fled, and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And, Dre, and Jehu drew his bow with his full strength, and smote Joram between the arms. And the arrow went out of his heart, and he sank down in his chariot. Now, I'm not a forensic um, investigator. I'm not. Right? I'm, I, I, full disclosure, right? But if Joram comes to Jehu, Joram turns around and is driving away. There is no longer a threat to Jehu. <laughs> there is, he is not, his life is not in danger. He is not in imminent danger. Jehu reaches down while he is still fleeing the authorities. He reaches down, grabs his bow at full strength, strikes him. And just so you're not sure, maybe you thought Joram turned around to see the arrow coming at him. Just to be clear, the Bible says it exits his heart, which means he got shot in the back. I'm not telling you to shoot people in the back. Jehu did it, though. You know what you would have said. Jehu, you're going a little too far. You've taken it a little too far, Jehu. And just so you think Jehu didn't take it far enough, let's continue reading, because this is really the beginning of Jehu's finest hour. Then Jehu said to Bidkar, his captain, Take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember how that, when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, saith the Lord, and I will require <coughs> thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore, take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. Verse number 30, and when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face, and tired her head, and looked out a window. And Jehu entered in at the gate, and said, has Zimri peace, who slew his master? And she said, excuse me. And he lifted up his face to the window, and said, who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs, and he said, throw her down. You know, didn't arrest her, didn't bring her to trial, didn't say, let's talk about your crimes against humanity. He said, hey, throw her out the window. A little overkill, a little too much, pastor. Listen, you think your pastor goes overboard on Sunday morning? Imagine working under jail. Pastor, you've gone too far, you've said too much, you've, you've made too many people mad. Throw her down. Mm hmm but he doesn't stop there. And her blood was sprinkled on the wall and the horses, and he trod her underfoot. Not only does she fall, her blood sprinkles on the wall. You know what Jehu does? He runs her over. Because, you know, just to make sure. And continue reading. Notice what Jehu does next. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink. You know what he did? He just killed all these people. Had a woman thrown out the window for a rebellion against God or witchcraft and evil. By the way, this is an evil woman, right? Don't feel bad for Jezebel. She, she deserved what she got, right? You know what he does? He goes inside, runs her over. Yep. All right, fellas, let's go get something to eat. <laughs> That's what Jehu did. He's a little chafed in the mind, if you will. David was a man after God's own heart, but you know what? He served God and did what God wanted him to do. It's about time you put aside the fantasies of what you think the Bible is and understand that God used men in the Bible who were nuts. 
He used men in the Bible that were crazy and said, you know what, I'll obey God. Not everything's right in my life. I may be in distress. I may be in despair. I may be in debt. I may be being discontented. But I can follow God. I can do what God wants me to do. I can pick up a sword and go to battle. I can shoot a bow and arrow. I can pick up my weapon and fight for the Lord. Too many Christians just want to sit back on a couch, watch their little Zoom church, and do nothing for God. You know what God says? I'll spew it out of my mouth. I don't want anything to do with that. Amen. That's what God wants. I'm not saying everything in Jehu's life was right, but you know what he did? When he did something for God, he went all the way. He said, I'm going to take care of business and get it taken care of. Too many Christians said, no, 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 that's enough. In that story, you've done it seven times. No, no, that's enough right there. Stop there. You don't have to go that far. You don't have to make them mad. You don't have to antagonize them. I wonder if Elijah was antagonizing when he mocked them. I wonder if David was antagonizing Saul when he came back with 200 foreskins of the Philistines. I wonder if he's antagonizing his brothers when he grabbed the head of the Philistine and drug it back to Jerusalem. When everyone else was too much of a coward to fight, you know what David did? He killed the giant, then he drug his head back. Chafed in the mind. Who's calling you chafed in the mind? Are there family members looking at you going, you know what, he's not all there. You've gone a little crazy. Hey, that's okay. I'd rather have that than God saying you're lukewarm. I'd rather that than God being unhappy with you. I think of the story with Jael. Cicero the king was in the tent. We don't have to turn there, read. We're running out of time now. Walks over with a stake from the tent. Drives it through his temple. Pins him right to the ground. <laughs> That's a little overkill, don't you think? God was pleased with it. <clears throat> Remember the story of Asa? When they, they spared, uh, spared the king, or Agag, the king with Saul. And Samuel comes, he goes, uh, what is this bleeding the, the sheep I hear in my ear? And, and Saul said, oh, the people made me, made me spare the best of the sheep so we could sacrifice it to God. Samuel looked at him and said, yep, you're no longer king, bud. Today's the day. It's all over for you. You know what he did? Right in front of Saul, he went down there and cut him all to pieces. All the people, all the, all, the, all the livestock that God told him to kill, the man of God went down there with his own sword and cut up to pieces right in front of Saul. <clears throat> That's the man of God that God needs. Not somebody who's going to stand up and apologize for what the Bible says. Never apologize for what the Bible says to anybody. Not to the liberals, not to the liberal politicians, not to the liberal Christians, not to the heathen pagans. Don't apologize to anybody. If that makes me crazy, so be it. But I'm in pretty good company. I'd rather be in that company than in your company. It was Samson who killed a thousand thousand uh, the enemy of the Philistines with a jawbone of an ass. Turn to Matthew chapter number 11. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 11. <clears throat> In verse number, uh, verse number 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, he hath the devil. You know what they said about John the Baptist? And by the way, when they said he has the devil, it's someone who's possessed, it's someone who's nuts. You know what they said about John the Baptist? Oh, he's just crazy. <clears throat> oh, he's babbling on again. He's over there preaching again. Is he out in front of the White House again? Leave Herod alone. Just leave him alone. Just... John, leave it alone, please. Let it go. It's not that big of a deal. You just stick inside your church. You stick inside your four walls and talk about the love of God. Only read, read Psalm 23 and nothing else about David's life. Don't read anything else about David's life. Don't tell us anything about David. We don't want to know anything about Elijah. Just talk about all that loving, gooey stuff. But John lost his head. You know why? They said he was crazy. All for preaching the word of God. John chapter number 10. <clears throat> Running out of time. <clears throat> 
Verse number, <clears throat> Jesus is talking, and we'll go to verse number 19 for lack of time. John 10, 19. There was a division, therefore, among the Jews for these saying. <clears throat> Interesting. Verse number 20. And many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath a, these are the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Here Jesus is healing the blind, preaching the word of God. You know what they said about Jesus Christ? Now, just so you know, you're thinking, okay, that was Old Testament, right? Uh, that was Old Testament, brother. New Testament, we're supposed to be different, right? Because that's the argument, right? They should speak well. The Bible says, well, when, when all men speak well of you, by the way. But here they are talking about Jesus Christ. He's preaching, and he's healing blind people. He is literally going around healing sick people. The most loving, caring thing you could do is find somebody who's never seen in their life and give them sight. Find somebody who's never walked in their life and give them the ability to walk again. Find somebody who's literally dead and give them back life. And you know what they said about him? He hath the devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? And then they said, well, how is he giving people sight unless he has the power of the devil? And you're shocked when the world criticizes you? You know how many times in the past few months, and it happened years ago too, and it'll happen again. Oh, that pastor, he's possessed. They said it about Jesus. They said Jesus was possessed of the devil. You know what they also told the people? He's crazy. Why are you going to listen to him? That's what he said. They're mad. Why hear you him? They're saying the same exact thing outside. You walk in the protest. Why would you go to that church? He's crazy in there. Yeah, okay. Thanks. God bless you. Chafed in the mind. It's okay though. Because what they think is crazy is what I think is normal. What the book says is normal is what they think is crazy. It's okay to be a little crazy when you're using a backwards dictionary. As long as God's pleased with me, that's what matters. Quit worrying about what the world says. Quit worrying about what they're going to say. Acts 26, 24. And he said, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul... Thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. Are you crazy this morning? <laughs> I don't want to see your driving record. Uh, I don't want to see your court appearances. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. But there ought to be something about your life that the world looks at it and goes, you know what, there's something wrong. Not, not, not for your anger, right? Not for your, your attitude, not for your work behavior, but for what you believe out of that book. Every single, people, every single one of the persons we described this morning was on a mission for God. And when God gave them a mission to do, they did it. And Elijah sat there and took on 450 prophets of Baal. David took on a Philistine. We all love telling the story, right? We all tell our kids about the story of David and Goliath. <laughs> Somehow we always... You ever read a children's book about David and Goliath? It always stops... The story ends when Goliath hits the ground. Never once do you tell your kids about David walking over there, cutting off his head, dragging it back to town. That's just as much of the story as it is the cute illustrated version of him leaning down, picking up five stones out of the brook, and walking to King Saul going, I'll fight Goliath. But that's what the world wants you to see. David wrote Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He wrote all that. But he also took down Goliath, lopped off his head, and drug it back to Jerusalem to show the people what they couldn't do. Hey, I'd hate to be embarrassed by a teenage boy who had more faith in God than me. I'd hate to be embarrassed by some wicked king who didn't obey God all the time in Jehu, who says, you know what, God, you want me to go kill her? I'll go kill her. Is that what you need done? And then at the end of it, I'm going to walk inside and eat. Hey, that's the Bible I know. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But let me tell you something right now. You know why you can find comfort in that? Because you fought the good fight. You ain't going to be able to rest at the... You know why Jehu ate like a king? Because he done worked all day. He spent a lot of time riding his chariot, taking care of business. He was hungry. But too many Christians want to sit back and relax and enjoy that part, but they don't want to do the work it takes to live a godly Christian life. You see, to sit back and enjoy the pleasures of God looking on you, you've got to go through the battle. Now, you don't have to go out there and ride a chariot to Jezreel this morning. You don't have to go down and to the, the, the valley of Gath and fight Goliath this morning. You know what you're going to have to do when you walk out those doors? You're going to have to live for God. 
You're going to have to obey God, dress the way God wants you to dress, talk the way God wants you to talk. And you know what that's going to get land you? Someone calling you crazy. But you know what the end of the day is? That's okay. That, that's perfectly fine with me. I almost wear it like a badge of honor because the world has gotten so crazy these days that being crazy is normal. Being crazy is the way God wants you to be. Don't be lukewarm this morning. I don't want this church to be a lukewarm church. I, I, I don't care what the world says when they say, oh, this, that, and the other, and they'll make something up next week. It'll be a whole new drama, and we'll find out. We're, I, listen, I might have to sign up the, for the Times Union because I'm learning. I've been coming here for a long time, and I learned things about this church I didn't know ever existed until I started reading the Times Union. But who cares what they say? Who cares what the world says? You decide to live for God, and when the wicked leaders call you chafed in the mind, that's okay, because guess what? King David became king again. Absalom hung himself with his long, faggy hair, and David was king again. Hey, stick with the king. Don't worry what the world says. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Dear Holy Father, a little different sermon this morning, I know, than usual, but it was enjoyable, it was fun, but Lord, there's a serious lesson there that we need to take everything we read from your word of God and do it with all of our ability. The Bible says, whatsoever thy hand findeth, do it, do it with thy might. I pray that you help us not to be half-baked Christians. I pray that you help us not to be um, <clears throat> lukewarm. And I pray that we'll take everything you say in the Word of God seriously and move on and serve you to the best of our ability. Thank you for the folks that are here. Bless them for the faithfulness, Lord. But Lord, when we get criticized for being crazy or chafed in the mind, Lord, I pray that we'll just say, you know what, that's not going to hinder us from serving God. Not going to hinder us from reading our Bible every day, dressing right, talking right, being in church when we're supposed to be in church, soul winning, supporting the preaching of the Word of God. And I pray that we'll do everything we can to serve you. In your name we pray. Amen.